Good morning. We believe. We believe. Today, uh, Tyson's preaching at the Cope Church, so we missed, missed the Sunday school skit time. You know, is it good? Is it good that our kids are being taught the Bible? You know, should, should parents and churches train kids according to, to biblical standards? You know, this, this week, uh, Tyson and I will also be headed to a pastor's conference, and, and I hope it snows like crazy over here while we're in Arizona. So I was looking at the weather forecast, the 70s, so yeah, it's going to be nice. So <laughs> it's looking at the weather forecast here, and who knows, you know. But uh, let's, let's turn to Acts 17, 11. You know, I, I love it when people listen. Um, you know, I don't want to stand up here and not be heard. Um, but uh, I love it when people do, do research afterwards and say, hey, man, what's this all about? Uh, do you know, the, the sermon to see if things are so. And, and I love it when I get asked, uh, questioned, or, or maybe corrected if things are not so. You know, this last week, someone did just that. You know, it was someone not from... This congregation, they, they viewed it on our live broadcast. So this, some people are actually watching out there, um, live stream. And, and they, they checked out and, and asked me where I received the information that in Canada they have a new law that you can't preach against homosexuality or anything like that. And uh, they did thank me for the message, so hopefully that, that didn't create a stumbling block for them. And, uh, and I pray that kind of my lack of research didn't hinder them to read the truth out of the Bible. But they, they did what I want you to do. I don't want you just taking my words and say, hey, Pastor Pete said this and this is that. You know, Pastor Pete, he, I'm, just, I'm just, just one beggar telling another one tell, where to find bread. Um, but... Uh, they did what I want you to do, and in Acts 17, 11, it says, Now the Bereans were more noble character than that of the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the Scriptures every day to see if Paul said was true. And, and another way to look at that eagerness is, is with openness of mind. You know, I, I, I don't want... To, we're, we're different, right? We come from different perspectives. And sometimes we got these presumptive thinking that, oh, this is, this is the way I was taught, this is the way I was raised, and, and we, 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 need to, we need to look at Scripture with an open mind. It is so vast and so powerful. And uh, so they, they looked at Scripture with an open mind and said, hey, and then checked out to see if it was so. And I want you doing the same thing. But let's, let's turn to Proverbs 19.18. I'm not a disseminator of truth. Okay? My word might be true, but... That's not, that's not what I am. The Holy Spirit is our guide. I'm here just to lead you to water. Maybe throw a little bit of salt on there to make you thirsty and, and say, okay, man, I'm going to check this stuff out. What he said was crazy stuff. I'm just here as one beggar showing another, you guys all or whatever, where to find bread. And, and I pray that the Holy Spirit, the guide, the one who convicts of sin... He's the power and he's the seal and basically the biblical therapist to pull our lost, blind, wandering selves from death and to realign them, ourselves, back in the way of life and truth. You know, the, the law from Canada, I have to admit, wasn't directed directly against preaching for a one woman, one man as the only true marriage. You know, I quote me last week, part of this message will be illegal if I were to preach it in Canada today. And they passed a law earlier this week that the church cannot preach that marriage between a man and a woman is the only true marriage. So while this may be a true statement, the threat against preaching biblical marriage is only a byproduct of a bigger piece of legislator directed at conversion therapy. That's the law. It was, a, it was a conversion. It's called C4. Okay? What else is C4? Okay. It's going to explode, right? <laughs> yeah, that's the bill. The bill is C4. But, but the bill defines conversion therapy as, okay, a practice, treatment, or service 
designed to change, I like the word change, change a person's sexual orientation to be heterosexual, change a person's gender identity as cisgender. Cisgender is basically a, um, a gender identity, and cisgender is the right, I mean, the truth, you know, what are you, a male or female? Um, change a person's gender expression so that it conforms to the sex assigned to the person at birth. The bill defines conversion therapy as a practice, treatment, or service designed to repress or reduce non-heterosexual attraction or sexual behavior, repress a person's non-cisgender gender identity, or repress a, or reduce a person's gender expression that does not conform to the sex assigned to the person at birth. So that, that's basically what the law says. This is what uh, conversion therapy is. It's, it's repressing or encouraging or directing a person away from the non-birth, yeah, what do you call it, uh, um, gender identity, uh, the signed, the signed assignment, your assigned birth. Okay. According to Pastor James Coates of the Grace Life Church in Edmonton, Alberta, and he was basically in prison for a while because he opened his church during COVID, um, the, the definition is intentionally broad, and it can clearly be used against any preacher or elder who either speaks against homosexual transgenderism or who counsels a person to obey Christ and abandon their homosexual gender actions and lifestyle. This means as of January 8, 2022, it would be against the law to preach, teach, or counsel regarding God's design for marriage and sexuality. Uh, that's according to Gra- James Coates of Grace Life Church. Is there a deterrent or a corrective action against those that defy the, the new law? I, I mentioned that a preacher could be put in jail. Um, this is what the law states, everyone who knowingly causes another person to undergo conversion therapy, and I, in, I gave the definition, including by providing conversion therapy to that person, is guilty of an indictable offense and liable to imprisonment of a term of not more than five years. Similarly, everyone who knowingly promotes or advertises conversion therapy is guilty of an indictable off- offense and liable to imprisonment for a term of not more than two years. So if you invite somebody to church in Canada and they preach against that, yeah, yeah. and somebody asked me, is it, is it per offense? What if there's 100 people in church? Do you get 500 years? I don't know. I, I, I didn't have an answer for that. But this is, this is the research I did, and, and hopefully, you know, I kind of cleared up some things about the law. But uh, it's easy to get hung up on this issue. I learned... I learned after I preached on, on Sunday last week, you know, they said, did you hear about the Lutheran pastor in, in Otis? And uh, he, uh, he submitted an article to the paper about homosexuality. I didn't, it never got published. But he, after his, his board, his church board learned of this, they fired him last week. The Otis, the Otis Lutheran Church. And uh, he's also a pastor, Scott, Scott Bicker, or Biker. Um, he's also a pastor. He's pastors two churches, the Akron Church and the Otis Church. And uh, he got fired because he attempted to write an article against homosexuality and trans- transgenderism. Biblical article. So this isn't just in Canada. This isn't just in Denver or California. This is Otis. This could be, where's our hearts? I hear now that uh, he will not continue in the ministry because of this. This threat against biblical therapy isn't, isn't just out there. It's coming our way. It's already here. What are we as parents here for? 
When our children are born, isn't there some kind of therapy that goes into directing our children into truth? You know, aside from their transgender or whatever that, that therapy, uh, um, conversion therapy, one of, the, one of the things that they outlawed was electrical shock therapy. You know, aside from electrical shock therapy, might there be some corrective measures to deter one child from hurting one another, from telling lies, from stealing cookies from the cookie jar, uh, candy from the grocery store, or maybe screaming at the top of their lungs? In Proverbs 19, 18, it says, Discipline your son, for in that there is hope. Do not be a willing party to his death. Do not be a willing party to his death. Let, let's turn to Proverbs 22, 5. You know, isn't there a, a therapy to encourage good behavior? Like, like, like sharing, a, if a kid shares or picks up their toys and, and helps with the chores? You know, that's a strong sentence. Don't be, do not be a willing party to his death. You know, if we just let our kids run free, right? Uh, I, I hear there's a, there's a, there's a saying, uh, range kids, you know, uh, just <laughs> do what you want. Uh, if, if, if we just let them, you know, pick whatever, how? Oh, you could be a dog, you could be a cat, you could be a gender, or you could steal, you could, ha! Ah. You, could, you, could, you, could, you could be deviant. When we do that, it's, we're, we're being a willing party to their death. You know, this world is on a collision course with death. This, this word, this Bible has the way, the truth, and the life to direct us from death to life. You know, and, and this, this world is so backwards with their agenda. They don't want any therapy converting them from death to life. Yet they can have all kinds of teachings and therapies to, yeah, you know what I'm saying. It's being taught. It's being, it's being we're being bombarded by this media. Why, why can't we have a law against conversion therapy? In Proverbs 22, 5, In the paths of the wicked lie thorns and snares, but he who guards his soul stays far from them. Train a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. Let, let's turn to Matthew 2, 19. You know, if, if there's a poison, we try to block the child from ingesting it, right? Or access and, and teach them, don't, don't eat this. Does anyone remember Mr. Yuck Stickers? I don't know, maybe it was just a Washington thing. I asked, I asked uh, and that's a Washington phone number. But uh, we had these Mr. Yuck Stickers that we, we would stick on, on uh, all our our poisonous thing. And I think even as a kid growing up, I had Mr. Yuck stickers, you know. Um, these were Mr. Yuck stickers. And when you saw a Mr. Yuck sticker on there, that meant don't eat it. Even if it looks like candy, like Tide Pods, you know. Um, don't eat it. Um, we are born with sin that needs to be therapized out as much as possible. The current infatuation with confused sexual identity is part of the sin nature. And the interesting thing is, the world, the public system, is using therapy uh, to encourage. You know, they've they, they got a practice, they got a service, they got a treatment, it seems like, to, to say, hey, be who you, whatever you want to be. Identify with ever, whatever you want to identify with. And, and, and they encourage it. And, and not only that, they say they, they give ideas as how this works. There's, there, there's one parent, I, I, I wasn't from our, our school, but there's, there was a parent that, that, that went to the board. He, he took, took the textbook and he took some pictures and he blew them up poster-sized pictures. And he took them to the board and they said, put them away. Those are too-sexually explicit. And he goes, he, goes, he goes, what if I were to take one of your kids and to showing, show me these pictures, would I go to jail? You know? 
I think he asked the governor that. And they said, yeah. I heard one, yeah. You know, we could scream all we want at this double standard, but if they're already promoting one sin, pointing out another sin is just going to throw gas on the fire. But the title of this message is Biblical Therapy. And I hope to use this current event as a segue to the childhood of Jesus. You know, can you imagine trying to raise the Son of God? I mean, the Messiah? You know, Herod wanted to kill him. So they fled to Egypt. You know, Joseph was warned in a dream, hey, go to Egypt. You know, after Herod died, Joseph and Mary were still getting messages from, from angels and dreams and stuff and, and what to do. And, and, but, but how did Joseph and Mary guide the Son of God? I mean, did, did, they, did they have to... They, they did some certain things, I'm sure. I'm sure they, they read God's Word, had a memorized Scripture. They, they, they had him, they did everything according to the law when he was a baby. You know, when he was eight days old, they had him circumcised and blessed, and they, they gave the doves and everything like that. But, uh, but in, in Matthew 2, 19, it says, After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up. Take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel, for those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, he will be called a Nazarene. Please, let's turn to Romans 5, 14. You know, Joseph was getting instructions from angels as what to do because he was raising the Son of God. There were threats. People wanted this child dead. You know, what are we? Who are we? Are we not also sons of God? Do we not risk death? You know, the devil goes about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. You know, and that's not the only enemy. The world is constantly bombarding us with a therapy to get us to be drawn, to be baited to, to be tantalized with a trap. And this isn't just a trap we... This is death. And then, there's another enemy. That's because we have some desires and passions that rage within us. That draw us and that pull us to the way of death. We got the devil, roaring lion. We got the world seducing us. And we got our flesh saying, oh, yeah, let me at it. Our flesh from day one. You know, Jackson, he's got a little picture in the, we had to saw him on the thing. He's five days old. And I bet he's a bit self-centered. I just, I, I just got that feeling, you know? Our flesh deceives us, it shocks us with, with feelings and emotions that draw us to death. And when we, we live life in the flesh, we go by feelings, not by sight. And we just go, oh man, I, I think that's the way I should go. And, and, and basically, we're just like one blind man leading another man to the, to the pit, to death. And then that's all that's happening with all this gendered blah, 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 you know? You're just a bunch of blind people. And the, and the best way is not to, 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 to fight those laws, but to, to show the light. Because the Holy Spirit is the one that convicts. 
We're not the Holy Spirit. We can draw out all the laws we want. It's called the um, social gospel. You know, it's not about us looking good. It's about us being Christ. You know, we looked at genealogies last week, and, and through one sin, death passed to all men. And, you know, maybe Eve, woman, didn't carry the sin because the command was directed to Adam. You know, Adam was carried the seed of the serpent. And it, it, it's kind of amazing, you know, you, you think about, you know, the, the seed of a man. It looks like a little bit like a serpent. It was the seed of the woman that carried the promise to crush the serpent. In, in Romans 5, 14, Nevertheless, death reigned in the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who was the pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass, for if many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to many. Again, the gift of God is not like the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so the result of the one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. For just as through the disobedience of the one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man the many will be made righteous. The law was added so the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And, and you, you hear the word grace, 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 but you also hear the word righteousness, righteousness, righteousness. There's, there's a place that God does a way that God changes our flesh, knocks it down, and brings in His righteousness. Please, let's keep your place here in Romans. We're going to turn to Luke 2.39. Jesus was supposed to be that perfect sin bearer. You know, Joseph had the angels telling him, hey, here is the way you got to go. This is, you got to escape. You, they, they're trying to take the ch child's life. But, but, but he also had the Bible. And we got the angels too. We got the Holy Spirit. And we got this word of God. And it directs us and guides us and warns us, hey, there's somebody, somebody after your life. There's a, there's, there's a direction I, I want you to go. There's a, there's a way that you can go to escape this death. You know, there's, there's, there's three things. After you. The devil, the world, and your flesh. Three things. Remember that. Three things. They had biblical therapy. You know, every one of us was assigned something while we were being knit together in our mother's womb. You know, and I, I'm not talking about your, your sexual identity, you know. I'm talking about who you were designed to be. We were created to be in the image of God. That was our design. We were knit to be the image of Christ. You know, Jesus was untainted by sin, and he fulfilled completely what he was assigned from before the foundation of the world. We were assigned the same image as Jesus. We converted to another identity. The other identity away from God's original intent 
was leading to death. You know, this identity was wretched. You know, it, it was selfish and, and uncompassionate. It was, it was covetous. You know, I want what somebody else has. You know, this is what we were. All of us. You know, that's what the Bible says. We were. Jesus wasn't. He, he from, from, from birth to death to resurrection to forever, he was, he was perfect. But this is what we were. We were converted from, somehow, we made a conversion from God's original intent as perfect being to being a sinful, selfish, on the way, on the road to death. But we were washed. We were resurrected. I believe in the resurrection. You know, this change is more than a result of conversion therapy. You know, as, as Joseph and Mary were fulfilling all of the law for the Son of God, they observed the feast. You know, when Jesus was 12 in, uh, in Luke 2, 39... When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of God, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. So they were observing everything according to the law. They they had the therapy going. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the feast according to the custom. After the feast was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, I I think that three has to do with our, our, our ungodly trinity, the world, the the devil and our flesh. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, seated, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? He asked. Didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Let's turn back to Romans 6. You know, Jesus, just, Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was God. You know, he was the perfect image of what God designed man to be. His parents trained him and did all that the law required for him. But Jesus, even as a boy, was led by his heavenly father. He didn't have any conversion therapy because he was already perfect and was always was. But thinking about all the attempts man does at trying to be different, including, you know, shock therapy, true eternal life doesn't happen through conversion therapy. You know, you ever, you ever, you know, it's, it's not by following laws. And, and, and that's what Ephesians says, you know, it's, it's not by works, lest any man should boast. It's by the grace of God. And so... You know, trying to, trying to obey this and do this and say, man, I got to work on this and I, I got to, I got, I don't know how to do this, you know. It's a work of grace. I don't know how to be righteous. Do you? But the Holy Spirit does. And that work of the Holy Spirit, that grace instills in us. Not just, not just a, a pseudo righteousness, oh man, I'm righteous before God, I can do what I want. No, 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 a righteousness that actually lives out in the flesh. It's fleshed out in righteous acts and deeds and our desires. We 
we could train us and our children, read all kinds of books, try to modify our behavior to line up with our peers, but it will be of no avail if there isn't a death to the old way. This converted temple needs to be destroyed so it can be raised in the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, and I'm thinking, you know, Jesus said, destroy this temple in three days and I will raise it up. And we're, we're, we're called the temple of the Holy Spirit. And I'm thinking, yeah, three days, three ways. Yeah. Figure out a way to, to, to not be affected by the world. Figure out a way to resist the devil and he will flee from you. Figure out a way to die to your passions and desires and to have the grace of God Re, I'm not saying convert. We've already been converted. But re, come back, be redeemed. Jesus redeemed us from the curse of the law. He redeemed our life back. It's not conversion. It's, it's, it's to take it back. Take back what we lost. You know, the conversion therapy came with the sinful nature. The world, the devil, and our flesh converted the eternal perfect intent to a dying, sinful being. The world, the devil, and the flesh continue with its therapy, leading to death. Biblical therapy will only work if there's repentance. Jesus said, you know, to the rich man, sell everything. Die to yourself. Pick up the cross. And follow him. You know, he said to the, to, the, to the woman that everybody wanted to stone, go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. As the world, the flesh, and the devil get bolder with their conversion therapy, understand that the power of Jesus has redeemed back what we were converted from. You know, beyond this, the Holy Spirit protects us in our original assigned state, sealed to the day of redemption. In Romans 6, starting with verse 1, what should we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. That's, that's not the idea. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? death. We were therefore buried with him through the baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will also certainly be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. Death he died, he died to sin once for all, but, he lived, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil's desires. Do not offer parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to Him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master because you're not under the law, but under grace." That's, that spells it out pretty good, doesn't it? Yeah. Jesus gives us a new life. You know, destroy this temple and in three days he will raise it up. You know, let, let, let's turn to Romans 8. You know, shock therapy seems intense. You know, you know everybody, anybody like, like to get shocked, Right? I know particularly Tyson is so afraid of electricity. He said the other day, he says, he says I finally got shocked by 110. I go, I go, how was it? He says, I survived. <laughs> but, but you know what? Jesus is going to go way beyond that. It's not shock therapy. It's death. 
Shock therapy ain't going to be enough. We need to die. We need to die to our passions and desires. We need to die, count ourselves dead to sin. But here's the cool thing. You know, it's, you know sometimes, you know, when you, when you, when you, when you die, um, there's a shock treatment that brings you back, gets your heart. There's the Holy Spirit. In Romans 8, 8, it says, Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit. If the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the, Holy, the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who lives in you. You know, ther therapy has its purpose. You know, we all need to be drawn to, to the bread of life and the, and, and the fountain of the Holy Spirit. That's the purposes of our services, our, our practices, and our treatments. The law could never save. The social gospel only veils the symptoms. As Jesus was about his father's business at age 12, for three days, absent from his earthly parents and the influence and therapy, he is what he created us to be and that we were converted away from. You know, thankfully, we can repent and believe that the redemption of that original assigned life was completely paid for by the death of Jesus in the grave for three days. And that the power that raised him is the same power that will give life to our mortal bodies and sustain it. Here's the bread and the water of life. It's up to you to reclaim what we were converted away from you. It, it, it is up to you to drink it in, to believe it, to accept it. To die to the world, our flesh, and Satan, and live in the newness of life. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you and we just thank you so much. Lord, we, we, we thank you for, for your original intent. To, to be holy as you are holy, to, to, to be the very image of God. Lord, we also thank you for giving us freedom. Freedom to reject you and freedom to see the way our rejection goes and how empty and the direction of death it is. Lord, you, 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 you've given us options. Lord, I just pray that as we were converted, we've all wandered and gone our own way. Lord, that we can go back, repent, Forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, give us that new life with new desire to have the good and perfect life that you've assigned us to. May we claim it because it's been redeemed and may we live it. And Lord, we ask for your help in the name of Jesus. Amen.